Hello, and welcome to the Spirit Realm Network. My name is Chris McKinnell, and I am the host of The Warren Files. And welcome to our premiere episode. I appreciate your joining us today. Uh, before I get started, I just want to ask that if you're watching this, um, please like and share the links so that everybody else can see what we're doing, and then they can also perhaps uh, learn something useful. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, if you don't know who I am. And again, I apologize if I'm a few minutes late. I had a couple of computer glitches. So now we're going to be uh, doing this on my iPad for tonight only. Um, I am the director of the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. I carry on the work of my grandparents, Ed and Lorraine Warren. I started working with them back in 1980. And today, the Warren Legacy Foundation is a worldwide network of people that helps anyone in trouble with the paranormal. I'm very lucky uh, to have some amazing people behind me and doing good work uh, around the world. As a matter of fact, one of those people uh, is uh, a host here on the Spirit Realm Network. Her name is Michelle Roos, and she is uh, one of the co-hosts of Into the Dark, and I think you should check that out. It's a pretty terrific program. So let's get started. Let me tell you a little bit um, about myself and about my grandparents. Uh, if you don't know who my grandparents are, that's fine, uh, but then I'm wondering, why are you watching The Warm Files? Uh, they started investigating the paranormal when they were children, really. My grandfather uh, grew up in a haunted house and his father didn't believe that he was seeing this old woman in the hallway uh, terrorizing him. Uh, she was, of course, someone who had used to live in the house, just a ghost. But it started my grandfather on a world, uh, a lifelong quest uh, into what is this phenomena that seems to afflict so many people and how do you uh, help people? And as you can see, it's become a family business sort of business, no money in it. Um, my grandmother, on the other hand, uh, started as a child when her paranormal or her psychic abilities uh, manifested while she was at St. Charles Catholic School in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was Arbor Day and they were planting trees and she saw the tree full grown and she mentioned it to one of the nuns and the nun said, we don't talk about those things. So uh, my grandmother quickly learned that it wasn't something she was supposed to talk about. When she met my grandfather, they were about 16 years old, and uh, he was working at a, um, at a movie theater. And he was an usher, and my grandmother and a couple of people, uh, a couple of her girlfriends had come into the house, or into the theater, and he had invited them out for Cokes after the movies and of course my grandmother being my grandmother decided to get a shake which was about three times the cost of a coke but as he said goodbye to them and he was crossing the street that night she could see this older man this this middle-aged man um heavy set and she's she knew right then that she was going to spend the rest of her life with him Within a year, uh, 17 years old, he had joined the Navy, he had gone into World War II, and they were already married and expecting a child, which was my mother. Um, so that's the origin of my grandparents' love. By 1952, they had um, started the New England Society for Psychic Research. And that was a very local concern. Uh, they mostly, at first, uh, went around and they were artists and they would paint pictures of houses on plates and then my grandmother being the much more uh, personable and easygoing one my grandfather would push her out of the car and send her to the house to sell the plate and that was their way of getting into a haunted house and then my grandmother would use her abilities to uh, figure out what was actually going on there after around 1960, 
seven, I'm guessing, so about 15 years later, they were beginning to get a real reputation, uh, a good reputation. And the church was calling on them to help in cases. And <clears throat> by 68, I believe it was, uh, don't quote me, it might be 67, uh, they got a call and it was about this spirit that seemed to be bothering these nurses. And they said, well, we'll check it out. And the nurses said, well, we've, we've got this Raggedy Ann doll. And it, it moves around the house by itself and it leaves messages for us on parchment paper. And one day, um, one of our boyfriends was sleeping on the couch and he woke up and he said that he had had a dream and you see we named the doll Annabelle and he had a dream that Annabelle was choking him and he got upset and he went over to Annabelle and he threw it and he said you're just a dumb doll you can't hurt anyone at which point he got three claw marks across his chest drawing blood at that point, they decided they better get some help, and they called their local priest, and the priest called Ed and Lorraine Warren. That is the origin of Annabelle. Now, there's also a lesson to be learned here. You see, prior to that, they had realized something odd was going on with this doll. They were at the dinner table, and they had been, you know, letting the doll sit with them at the dinner table, just playing around while they ate, and the doll lifted its hands up on the table, both of them. And they said, wow, there must be a ghost in there. So they contacted a medium that they knew, and they did a seance, mistake number one. And the medium said that it was the ghost of a little girl who had been killed in front of the house and it was just looking for someone to love her. Now that's the classic way that you create an attachment is through that emotional tie that they try to make with you so that they can then create a psychic attach attachment and then things turn dark. And that's exactly what had happened with Annabelle. Things turned very dark. Um, I do want to caution you for those of you who haven't seen me before the Annabelle movies are not true. Nothing about them is true. As a matter of fact, the second movie, Annabelle Origins, is really about the lies that the entity had told the nurses. The true story of Annabelle, or as close to it as Hollywood can get, is told in The Conjuring 2. That's a good portion of the real origin of Annabelle. There is another um, thing that had happened with Annabelle, a couple of things actually. Um, one day, Father Bill Charbonneau, a, a dear friend of the family, had come over to show my grandparents his brand new car. This was around 1974. And he said, Ed, I hear you've got a doll that attacks people. And my grandfather said, yeah, uh, Father, it's downstairs. Would you like to come see it? So they went downstairs, and Father Bill walked right up to the doll, picked it up, threw it across the room, and he said, God is stronger than the devil. And my grandfather said, yes, Father, God is stronger than the devil, but no man is. That night, after leaving the house, Father Bill was in his brand new car, and this halo of light came straight at his car. And just before he veered off the road into a ditch, he saw Annabelle in the center of that light. The car was completely totaled, and he broke his leg. So you don't mess with the paranormal. You don't challenge it. Not on your own power. If you're going to do anything, if you're a researcher, if you know what you're doing, then you do it by the power of God, whatever way you see God. You don't do it in your own name. You invoke that higher power that you have faith in. In my experience, God doesn't seem to care what you call God. 
he answers, she answers to your faith. That's what's most important. So, um, the other point I wanted to make about this, though, is remember they had called in this person who didn't really know what she was doing. She had the best of intentions. She probably was a very good medium. But because she wasn't trained to work with these entities that are not human, she was also easily fooled. A lot of these people who are on the internet right now don't really know what they're doing. They're there to get the clicks and the likes and so forth. And unfortunately, they're not there to actually solve the problem, even with the best of intentions, because they don't know what they're doing. That's the purpose of the Warren Legacy Foundation. We're here to help educate future generations of researchers. We're here to help the general public, and we're here to educate, which is why I'm doing this today. I'm here to educate. By the way, I didn't mention this, um, just for a little bit of fun for you. Uh, I'm actually speaking to you from Cabo Frio, which is about 160 miles north of Rio de Janeiro um, in Brazil. Wherever I am in the world, and I'm almost never going to be in the United States, but wherever I am in the world, I'm constantly trying to learn about the paranormal and trying to share it with you. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is to learn about a couple of different Afro-Brazilian religions. They're called Umbanda and Kimbanda, and they're fascinating. I, I was actually uh, very, very lucky that I, I have friends who are Umbanda priestess and um, initiates and so forth. And these are people who actually channel spirits. and. There are particular spirits, each from a different house that they work with, and they work with um, five or six houses, and they, they literally let these spirits take over and channel them to give messages to the congregation, individual messages. I've had quite a few myself. It's very, very interesting and very effective, and I'm trying to figure out if, because you see, I'm an exorcist, and I'm trying to think, is there a better way to do this? So I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I appreciate everybody being on here tonight. It, it means a great deal to me. Thank you so much. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, please like and share. We do want to get the word out. Please like the uh, Spirit Realm Network. Please um, check out their all of their wonderful programs. And please share. The more you help us to get out the word, the better it's going to be for the general public. We have good programs, and we're trying to help everybody. So, uh, for Lisa, yeah, I, have to, I did grow up in Connecticut, but I've also lived in over 55 places in my life. I've lived in on five continents and uh, over a dozen countries. I've been to a few dozen others. Um, and I'm constantly learning about the paranormal, and I hope to share all of that with you. Um, somebody had asked, um, how do you, let's see, sorry, Jen, and Jen, I apologize, I'm not going to say your, your name correctly, Jen Bukbari, how do you help children who see spirits? It is very natural for children to see spirits. It, as you become an adult, we're, we're taught to be blind to these things. They're actually, um, it's a, extremely natural to be psychic. We're all born somewhat psychic. Um, if you have children who are having these issues, teach them not to be afraid. Remember that ghosts are only people. And it's best not to interact with them unless you know them. Even, even in the case where you think it's your grandfather, you should be very careful. Um, Amy Sears is asking how to get in touch with her mediumship abilities. I want to say the Warren Legacy Foundation has a psychic support group. Now, this is only for psychics, and it's very important that you understand that. We will ask you some questions to make sure that you are psychic and that you have the best of intentions for being there. Uh, but if you are, please contact us through the Warren Legacy Foundation Psychic Support Group. 
Um, there are three questions there. Please answer them, and then we'll do what we can to help you. Uh, for children, there is a wonderful, wonderful resource on the Facebook page, uh, Facebook, um, for gifted and empathic children. I will put a link up on my Facebook page, both on the Warren Legacy Foundation page and on Chris McKinnell. So you can find it there. Uh, it's run by a, a dear friend of mine, and I trust her very, very much. Uh, she's got terrific resources, and they'll be of a great help to you all. So, um, I took a lot of notes here because this is my first time doing this. I wanted to um, also mention, as I said, that I've been doing this since 1980. And how long have I been involved with exorcisms? Uh, since I was about 20... One? 21. That's when I uh, assisted on my first exorcism. I was 16 when I went on my first case with my grandfather. And it was a poltergeist case. And I know that a lot of you have already heard this story, so I'll, I'll make it short and sweet. But my grandfather took me into a haunting with uh, the family. Well, the husband and wife were waiting for us when we got there. They wouldn't go in without us. And we went in with another man who was assisting us named Paul Bartz. Uh, he's no longer with us either, unfortunately. Uh, this was in Lee, Massachusetts. And we were greeted by these horrible, large pounding noises in the wall. As we walked up the stairs to the main bedroom and the children's bedrooms, you could feel the wall vibrating. And you could hear clawing in the walls. Not mice or rats or even raccoons. We're talking wolves. And when we got to the top of the stairs, the um, attic door, the, the pull-down stairs had been pulled down. And the crucifix hanging up in the, um, in the bathroom was upside down. My grandfather decided it would be a good idea for me to sit in the master bedroom in the dark and wait for something to happen. Now, I'd been afraid of the dark my entire life up until that night. And my grandfather had me sitting up there by myself with the pounding going on, the clawing and the growling and everything else, while they're downstairs lighting holy church incense in a pot and trying to stir things up. My grandfather could be a bit of a sadist. Um, so for about 45 minutes to an hour, I'm sitting up there and I'm like, Gramps, I hear this. Okay, Chris, let us know if anything else happens. Okay. And finally, Paul Bartz came up, relieved me, and I went downstairs. They kept trying to bring the Holy Church incense upstairs, and it kept going out. And that doesn't happen normally. So they put the pot in the kitchen and they left it. That night, we were on an all night radio station um, with Brian Dow, WTIC 1060 AM radio out of uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Still remember that. And at three o'clock in the morning, my grandfather and the lady of the house are sitting on the couch. I'm in the easy, in the recliner, in the corner, and upstairs are Paul Bartz and the, uh, the man of the house, all on the phones. I've got a crucifix in one hand, the phone in the other hand. Under my breath, I'm saying, by the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. By the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. And... These two hulking black shapes came down the stairs and stood there. The woman screamed, her face was on fire. It's about 3.15 in the morning. My grandfather sh shined a um, flashlight on her face and you could see the three claw marks appearing with blood dripping down. At that point, that pot with the Holy Church incense flew around the corner straight at my head, just veered off, hit the window behind me. The pot crumpled. And the shade flew up. The window didn't break. I said, oh shit, over the radio. Uh, no time delay that day. The woman screams, she wants out. I'm thinking, I'm going to help her get out. I get up. I go to the front door. The lights start going on and off by themselves. The door's locked. It hadn't been locked. We had already been out. 
and she's screaming. The easy chair that I'd just been sitting in flips over, comes about five feet across the room, and then the door opens by itself, and she and I got out. That was my first night in a haunting. Um, someone just asked uh, about um, the artifacts in the museum. The museum was never really opened to the um, to the public. It's always been more of a repository than anything else. It was open uh, by a special invitation or by small groups. And right now it's owned by my mother and her husband. And unfortunately, due to zoning laws, um, new zoning laws, they can't even show it privately anymore. Um, they've toyed with the idea of opening it elsewhere. I, I don't know how far they've gotten with that. And because I'm not in the United States, I really don't have a, a part in that. Uh, to answer your question about being afraid, that's really actually important. After that night when I was 16, I was never afraid again. And that's really, really important when you're dealing with the paranormal. Because, as my grandmother put it, like attracts like. The energy you put out there is the energy you get back. And if you're throwing out a lot of fear and a lot of negativity, you're going to empower something negative. And if you put out positivity, then you're going to attract something positive. Be very careful when you're dealing with the paranormal that you don't get overwhelmed by your own fears. Fear is the true enemy here. <clears throat> Where can you find Holy Church incense? Um, well, Lisa, you can find incense online. Um, for instance, Dragon's Blood is a very good one to use. It does have to be blessed. You can go get it blessed by um, your pastor or priest. Um, you can go to a, bod uh, a botanica. Uh, they'll have it available to you. Remember that things um, in the Catholic religion, anyway, are not sold blessed. You do have to go see someone afterward to get it blessed. Um, you can also bless it yourself if you are in a good place. Uh, you can um, ask for God's blessing and bless it. God, you know, Jesus gave us that ability. So keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, any other questions that I, I've missed here? I apologize. Um, Yeah, you don't you don't hide your fear. You conquer your fear. That's important um, because it doesn't matter if you're hiding it. It's still there. And I tell my clients, remember that these things are just parasites. They're they're feeding off of you. They don't have that much power on their own. And I mean, yeah, of course there are some really bad ones out there, but not many. And most of the time, what you think is demonic probably isn't. It's probably just a ghost or even a thought form, which is something that we self-manifest. Uh, we get that a lot. We get a lot of people um, who are psychic and manifest things or people who are autistic or uh, are going through uh, tremendous anxiety. And because they've got some gifts, they project things outward. And because they don't have a lot of control, that, those things can turn bad. Um, What's the most haunted item in the museum? That's a hard question. The most famous, of course, is Annabelle, but the most haunted. I don't think Annabelle's the worst thing in there. Uh, there are a number of things in there that are very, very evil. Um, and you have to remember, it's not the item, it's the thing attached to the item. It's the energy attached to the item that makes it deadly. But there, I, re I recall uh, in particular, there is a small uh, gravestone with the name Warren on it. And it was a curse that was plant, uh, placed on my grandfather. It's a whole plot and moss and other things. And um, yeah, that was pretty deadly. It could have gone very badly for you. What makes you decide which country to live in next? Honestly, it's happenstance sometimes. I knew I was coming to Brazil. I know I want to visit a great deal of uh, South America before I go back to the United States for a week. Uh, I'm going to be in on Rock Island, uh, Illinois, for a uh, two-night event. 
It's um, October 2nd through the 4th. And this is pretty cool. It's a um, former brothel, a haunted former brothel and speakeasy. And we're going to be spending two whole nights there. We're also going to have a meet and greet. Uh, we're going to have a, a meal together. I'll do a, a, a presentation or two. And then uh, we're going to lead people on investigations. It is a safe place. The female uh, spirits there uh, can get kind of um, handsy with the men. Uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, but I'm going with good people. I would never bring anybody someplace that was dangerous. I, I don't believe in that kind of paranormal touring. I have been given so many questions here and I apologize. I know I'm not going to get to them all. But I promise you that I will try to get to them by next time. Um, if you see something dark, if you see a shadow person, I, I'm not fond of that term. I know it's out there in the general public right now. I know there are a lot of theories about what are shadow people. And I know I'll get in a lot of trouble for what I'm about to say. For the most part, I think they're just people. They're ghosts. Just like the black-eyed children were projections or thought forms that manifested. You have to remember that these inhuman spirits, they take on the form of whatever scares us, whatever enters our consciousness. Whenever I'm around the world, the paranormal presents itself differently. You're never going to get a Christian demon in a Hindu family. It doesn't happen. It depends on what your belief system is, how it manifests. So in the 90s, you know, there were all of these gray alien sightings. I'm not saying they don't, that these aliens don't exist. I absolutely believe aliens exist. I mean, it's a, it's a huge universe. But I am not sure that all of these things... Um, are actually aliens that they're seeing, just like the black-eyed children that started presenting themselves in the 50s, or the phantom hitchhiker that's been sighted all over the world. These are um, things that have entered our public consciousness and they manifest. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, somebody just asked what my favorite exorcism is, and I, I have to say, honestly, exorcism is spiritual warfare. It isn't, it isn't um, fun, and it can be quite deadly, and when it's not done correctly, it is deadly. Um, and even after it's done, I've worked on some of uh, Ed and Lorraine's biggest cases. I've led some of their biggest cases, and we learned a hard lesson with Maurice Theriault. Uh, that's the... Um, Satan's Harvest book, a great book written by two Boston Globe uh, reporters. I highly recommend it. Um, we didn't do work with him after the fact for years. And unfortunately, that means that the underlying problems were never dealt with. And a few years later, the thing came back. And it took him over, and just exactly like his father, he picked up his rifle, he tried to kill his wife, blew off her arm, dragged her back into the house, and then in a moment of clarity, he didn't kill her. He killed himself instead. So not my favorite, certainly not, um, but it taught me something really important. It also. My grandfather had a heart attack during that exorcism. So it, it was quite serious. This is not a game. This is not something that you do as a hobby. Please keep that in mind. Um, and these sessions that we're going to have, these are not to teach you how to do this work. If you actually want to learn how to do this, um, I want you to send in um, an application to the Warren Legacy Foundation and let us 
do an interview with you, let us see if perhaps we can work with you, mentor you, and then help you to become a good researcher. We need people all over the world. And if you're the right person, we want you to be with us. And we will help you form teams with other people that we've got. So you don't have to come to us with a team. If you're a part of a team, fantastic. We want to see your team. But we want to make sure that you're doing this for the right reason. If you're doing this because of ego and because of attention, you're not doing it for the right reason and you're not going to work out with us. And that's really important to keep in mind. For us, this is a ministry. This isn't a job. It's a calling. Um, as to what I use on a, on a case, I do tend to go with um, a lot of Christian ritual. I was raised Christian. I've studied Buddhism, um, Hinduism, uh, the Quran. I, I've lived in three Muslim countries. Uh, I lived in Israel. Uh, I've studied Judaism. And I've studied a number of different Christian sects. I don't consider myself a Catholic anymore, but I do use a lot of their ritual because it helps me to focus my faith. And that's really what's important. It doesn't matter what you use, as long as what you're using helps you focus your faith and call on God. That's how you accomplish the task. So, um... There's so many other things I wanted to share with you, but let's uh, at, get to a couple more of your questions. Uh, oh, this is important. People, you know, call me a demonologist, and I think it might even be on my own Facebook page. It's something I've always been uncomfortable with. And the reason for that is, well, first, my grandfather said I was a demonologist when I was 24. I really didn't feel qualified. Uh, it's only in the last couple of years I'm willing to accept that title, but it's with the caveat that I'm not a Christian demonologist. I don't believe in Christian demonology. I don't teach it. I don't, I don't think that demons have names. I don't think that demons are Christian or fallen angels or anything that we truly understand, any more than we truly understand God. I, for me, my faith, and I'm a minister, my faith comes in understanding that God is the creator of a billion billion universe uh, galaxies my brain is never going to be able to encompass that and that's where my faith comes in that's how I've learned to have faith is accepting that I will never know the mind of God that I'm here to learn compassionate love and to give to others that's, that's my goal in life, is to help people. Uh, and I, I hope I'm going to be able to do that always. <clears throat> I have been reminded uh, to remind you, please do like uh, the Spirit Realm Network, and please share. Uh, they've got a bunch of wonderful uh, programs uh, at 9 tonight in, on the East Coast. Uh, Unfortunately, it's his last episode, but readings by Jake. Jake is absolutely wonderful. He's given me a reading, and he was very, very good. Uh, and I would highly uh, recommend that you do that. Um, I've been asked, do I do uh, investigations as well? Of course I do. I'm out there trying to help people. I don't believe, for me personally, I don't believe in going into a place like a, an abandoned building just to see what's there. If I'm not there to help somebody, then I don't really have a reason to be there. Um, the event that we're doing in October, I'm doing it for a number of reasons. One, I'm doing it to help um, get the word out about who we are. Number two, I'm doing it to educate the public because we're also going to live stream it on the internet. And I'm doing it because if there are spirits there, and there are, then maybe we can help them to pass over. And that's really important as well. So, um, I, I do know um, one of my colleagues was asking a uh, question. He's from Costa Rica, and his name is Israel. Um, so, I'm going to try and figure out if I can find that here. 
Here we go. Has any negative energy from the museum ever haunted me? You know, I lived with my grandmother the last year of her life. And I lived with Annabelle for the last year of my grandmother's life. No. no the, the place is a little bit haunted now uh, by my grandfather and my grandmother who check on us and check on the place. But no, I've, I've never had any attachments. I've been very um, careful. Uh, the way I protect myself is using the white light of God. Uh, you take a few moments and it does get much easier with practice but I, I always tell my clients do this every morning and every night while you're in bed and you're at your most relaxed and close your eyes take some deep cleansing breaths in through the nose hold it and out through the mouth and then picture this white loving light in the center of your chest and feel it growing and expanding warm like warm honey spreading through your chest, filling you up, moving down your torso, down through your legs, filling up down through your feet and your toes, up through your shoulders and through your hands, up to your neck, filling up your whole head, and then spilling out of the pores of your skin like the most brilliant white light in the universe, creating a white bubble around you so bright that you can't be seen inside of it. And believe me, when you practice that, it becomes almost instantaneous. The ritual helps you to focus your faith to call on God for protection. And it is very, very effective. It is actually, um, that creative visualization is a way of manipulating reality. It's a, a bit of quantum physics. Um, it often surprises people that somebody who does my work, um, Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth Torres is also a member of the Lauren Legacy Foundation. He's on with us this evening. Um, he's out in California. If you need help, you contact him. We've got Art Diaz. Uh, he's in Mexico, and if everything is going right, he's offering you um, Spanish translations for our Spanish audience. I hope that's working out. I haven't had the opportunity to find out. Um, but when you're focusing your faith through these rituals, you are manipulating um, reality. You are manipulating energy, and you're setting psychic boundaries. I've seen it done all over the world in every religion where you set the limits for these things and how they manifest and what they can do to you. You set those limits. When you don't set those limits, they set the limits. And that's when things get out of control. So, do we have other questions? Alright, I have a little more time and I wanted to talk to you about a couple of my cases. Um, you've all heard of the, um, the haunting in Connecticut or the Schmerl's case, uh, the haunted. Uh, these were a couple of more of my cases. Um, most of the new stuff we don't uh, advertise and the reason for that is I've learned from my grandparents how destructive publicity can be um, so if you are in need of help and you're worried about reaching out and I, I know that in South America this is a real concern um, it's not talked about uh, not just South America but I'm, I'm was just speaking to a colleague about that this afternoon and I just want you to know that if you're in trouble you can come to us and your privacy is guaranteed we might talk about your case but we're never going to talk about your specific identifying information we'll never do that we will educate the public without exposing you to the public so Please, if you need help, we don't charge to help you. We're here just for that reason. Um, somebody had asked me, do I have any gifts? Yes, but I've never been comfortable with them. Uh, when I was younger, I could see auras in my 20s. Um, 
and when I was even younger than that, I could hear things. Um, scared the hell out of me. But in my 20s and even in my teens, when I would do readings for people, I would read their auras, they would get terrified because I knew too much. And I learned to suppress that. I learned I, that wasn't for me. That's not who I want to be. I don't want to scare people. So all I use today, except on the rarest of occasions, when I go into a home, I discern whether or not I'm dealing with something human or something inhuman. Inhuman meaning something that has never lived on earth. Uh, not like a, a pet that's died, because they do also um, come back. Um, I had my, my dog Brandy, died when I was about um, 21. And he followed me for over 20 years. Every time I got sick, he would come and lay down on the bed with me or nudge my hand with his nose just to let me know that he was there and watching out for me until I got a new dog. And as soon as I did, that was it. Brandy left. He was like, yeah, you got it. I'm good now. And he passed over. Um, I'm sorry. Israel had another question here. Yes, uh, absolutely. Israel asked me, has my life ever been in danger? A number of times. Far too many times to count, really. Um, one case just a few years ago, um, before I went on the case, I kept having problems. The car wouldn't start. My glasses went missing for three days and I couldn't see. My back went out. And also, and this is the part that made it very paranormal, my... Um, my, the gas on my, my stove turned on three times overnight and filled up the house with gas. The light didn't come on, which never happens in my house. You know, you light it and the flame comes on. Simple. But no, that happened. And then after that same, no, it's a different case, excuse me. Uh, another case, almost at the same time, both of them were in Philadelphia. As soon as we got done breaking a curse, and boy, I had trouble believing in curses for the longest time, but it turns out they're real. Um, on the way back after dealing with it, the, th the thing wanted its um, pound of flesh, and we got into a real car accident. The, the brakes just went out. We smashed into the car in front of us. Um, luckily, we weren't hurt too badly. But these are the kind of things that happen all the time. Uh, another case I was in, uh, matter of fact, was the Schmurls. Um, and I had just gotten to the top of the stairs where Mrs. Schmurl was, and the gentleman that I was um, working with for that particular weekend. And all of a sudden I'm levitating over the stairs and I'm about to go backwards down the stairs. And Luckily, they were both there and they grabbed me like a balloon in the air and pulled me in. So, yeah, yeah, you can get hurt. You can get killed. And people do. Um, another colleague of mine, I was sending him on a case. And the night before they went on this really, really bad case, this young man had a stroke out of nowhere. Uh, sorry, I believe in coincidence, but that's a little too much to believe. I was asked, what's it like growing up with my grandparents? The truth is, my grandmother was the most grandmotherly person you could ever hope for. Um, holidays were huge affairs with tons of presents for each of us. And she would be baking all day and cooking, baking for days ahead, and then cooking all day, wouldn't sit down to eat with us because she was puttering in the kitchen and getting everything for everybody. That woman was a bloody angel. And it was wonderful. My grandfather, on the other hand, he wasn't a grandpa. He, he, I called him Gramps, and that was about right. He was um, a cantankerous guy. He had a great sense of humor. He was very, very protective of animals, um, had a strong sense of justice, and um, he, he could be a real joker. But he also had a bit of a type A personality, and he's like, come on, Lorraine, let's get going. Sometimes. So, uh, 
What was it like growing up with him? Uh, it was weird in school. You know, I was the kid with the ghost hunters for grandparents, and um, that was different. Um, especially during the Amityville era, or as in the new movie that's coming out, Conjuring 3, when Arnie Johnson was um, going through his murder trial. That was tough. That was, that was really difficult. You know, my grandparents tried an unusual um, tactic uh, to use possession as um, a way of uh, saying that he wasn't responsible for what had happened. Well, I was only 13 or 14. I knew that wasn't going to fly. But, you know, I was 13 or 14. Who's going to listen to me? <coughs> um, you know, the funny thing is, um, Melissa, you asked uh, if my grandmother ever did readings on me. Sort of. Um... She was the most amazing psychic that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, no one compares to her, and believe me, I've got some great people working with me. Um, Michelle Roos, Catherine Sorlos, these two are scary as hell how accurate they are. And I give them stuff separately, and I compare it and to one another without them knowing I'm doing it. And they're so accurate. But my grandmother, she was on a whole nother level. And I'm saying this as a total skeptic, and I am. I'm, I'm a complete skeptic. I'm, I'm far more scientifically based than you would imagine. Um, but she could be outside of a house and tell you the whole history of that house without ever walking into it. I've seen her do it. And I, I was next to the reporter who had notes on a story he had not yet written. And he was sharing those notes with me as she's reading this stuff, or rattling this stuff off. I mean, things like the bloody butcher's apron on this fat entity that came into the house with the smell of rotting flesh and terrorizing the family. And I'm like, holy crap, my grandmother's getting all of this from out on the street? But... She could not read the people she loved because when you're emotionally invested it's very very difficult to read somebody it is your, your emotions get in the way you want to believe the best in the people you love and that was the thing with my grandmother she always wanted to believe the best so she wasn't looking uh, at the truth often when she would look at us um, she was looking at what she wanted to see. Now, I, I used to think she lived in a, a little bit of a fantasy world sometimes, because she just saw the best of me all the time. I knew better. <laughs> um, what else do we have here? How do you know, Renee asked, how do you know if you have gifts? She believes she has they had them when she was a kid, and someone put a block on them. And here's the thing, we put blocks on our own gifts. From the time we're children, we learn not to believe in what we're seeing. Um, and we start to block it ourselves. Yes, you can work on that. Meditation is a great way of opening yourself up, but you must be very careful because you also have to know how to close yourself off. I teach something, um, and they're actually the reason we started the the uh, psychic support group is because after the movies um, we realized that our reach had now become global and we needed to do something to help as many people as we possibly could and so I talked to my grandmother and she and I agreed that we should start the Warren Legacy Foundation I wanted to keep their names alive and that is how we got started with that. But all these people started asking for help because of their empathic abilities. They were overwhelmed. They were suffering from anxiety and depression. And I realized, because you know my background is in psychology, among other things, and um, I realized we needed to do something to help these people. So I started the psychic support group. And one of the things we teach is 
we teach people is how to psychically ground yourself. Um, now this is based completely on quantum physics. Uh, you go outside in your bare feet and you take those deep cleansing breaths, closed eyes, and you must be on earth or grass. You can't be on concrete or stone. You have to be in touch with the earth. And picture this white cord going down from the top of your head, straight down through your body, and deep into the earth like a lightning rod. And then picture all of that negativity that you've picked up throughout the day sloughing off of you, going down deep into the ground, uh, into the earth to ground out. And this works, and then you allow that energy from the good earth to fill you up again. And I've done this with thousands of psychics over the years, and it, it does work wonders. Matter of fact, it works for people who are depressed. If you just take walks and bare feet on the grass, go out, it really does help you. It's very healthy. We're coming near the end of our, our first episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank all of you for being here today. It has been a real treat for me to work with you and to talk to you. And I hope you'll come back next week. And if I've missed anybody's questions, I apologize. I promise I'll get better at this. Um, I also want to remind you that Readings by Jake is coming up in just a few minutes. I highly recommend that you check it out. Next week, um, an hour from now, uh, we will also be having uh, Teen Paranormal, which should be a quite an interesting show. I'm looking forward to checking it out myself. Uh, I will be back here next Friday, uh, June 5th at 8 o'clock, and I hope to have a special guest. I'm going to ask my producer how to go about having a guest on. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is on Mondays at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we also offer a Zoom session. Uh, you can find the link on the Warren Legacy Foundation page or on the Chris McKinnell page on Facebook. And for the first, uh, I think it's 100 people, I, I'm not positive, uh, who come, you're able to get in and talk to me and my colleagues and uh, learn some more. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, for those of you who joined us late and want to watch this, you can find us on The Warren Files. Uh, YouTube channel or the Spirit Realm Network YouTube ch uh, channel and also it'll be available uh, later either today or tomorrow on our own uh, Facebook pages. Uh, please stay tuned for readings by Jake in just a minute or two. I want to say God bless you all. Please stay safe and I'll see you soon. Take care folks.